Welcome to Mr. Brown's Basement, a channel devoted to sharing the craft of repairing, restoring, and modifying vintage electronic gear, and other random stuff. I've always had a weakness for interesting and unusual electronics. That's why my channel is interesting and unusual, or at least it tries to be. This is an AWA TP719 object, and you'll see what it is in a moment, not yet. I've already released the catch, and you'll now see what's inside. Yes, it's a 7-inch reel-to-reel tape recorder. This is a compact machine, but it's full-featured. With automatic volume control, tape counter, and three speeds, we'll get to that in a moment, a recording level meter, and indicator, tape direction and mode control, and controls for volume and tone. How are three speeds managed when you only have two positions? And that's done by an old trick, well, maybe a 60-year-old trick, by changing the size of the capstan. That's where the spare capstan stays. I'm going to remove the tape head cover. You can see that the tape passes over the two heads. One is play record and one is erase. And it is mono. And the tape is driven by this spindle, the capstan, plus the pinch roller, which is pushed. I'll go into play which are pushed together and pull the tape along. The size of the capstan can be changed by removing this screw and revealing a smaller capstan underneath. Now when the tape plays, it will be driven by a capstan of a much smaller diameter. That part gets parked right over here for storage. It's a clever and simple solution. As you see, it runs off the line or off eight d size batteries or off a car adapter. It accepts an external speaker. Auxiliary is probably another input, another audio input. And these two plugs are for a standard 1960s microphone. The microphone jack actually goes in there but some microphones were equipped with a separate switch which allowed you to turn the motor on and off on the microphone and that plugged in there. Underneath is where power is supplied. The line plugs in right over there. If you have a car adapter or another 12 volt source, it plugs in there. The battery pack connects to this plug here Unfortunately, I didn't get the battery pack that holds 8D cells, but I'm sure I can order one on eBay. But I didn't get the door. If somebody watching this video knows a good source for this door, and for this door, please leave a comment in the section below. This compartment is where the microphone would be stored. Let's power it up. Hopefully there will be no accompanying smoke. It's a little bit fast. Okay. That's more reasonable. Let's try taping it. Here, let's try it at this speed. Okay, I guess I have to put the capstan back. Ohio 
sounds like something recorded off the radio, maybe late 1970s, if they're talking about Disco Duck. I have no idea. Let's see if I can make a recording. Of course, I'll have to find a microphone to plug into it. Here is an old microphone from the 1960s. It's got a double plug on it. The bottom one is for the switch, and the top one is for the monaural microphone. So it's plugged in there. The on-off will probably affect not just record, but playback too. Yeah, it does. I'm going to reset the counter. And let's try recording. Okay, so this is a, a machine that is meant to prevent you from accidentally pressing record. You have to press record and forward at the same time. Test, 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 test. And now to play. It did not play back. I don't have a schematic for this machine, so I'll have to use what I know about tape recorders to troubleshoot. I know that the signal is getting as far as the amplifier because the meter works. Everything after the meter, the mixer, the bias oscillator, and the head, they could be working or not. With an oscilloscope, I could see if any signal is available there or not. This is the voltage I'm reading off the record head. At 10 volts per division, it's about 15 volts peak to peak. It's sine wave because you see the bias oscillator, probably around 40 kilohertz. And when I speak loudly into the microphone, test, 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 you can see that my voice is modulating the signal, which means there might possibly be something wrong with the amp not giving me very much modulation. Possibly a bad transistor, wouldn't be surprising to me. This one appears to use these screws. I guess it was part of the design. They didn't want screw heads showing to give away what this was. Removing those five screws reveals the mechanism, which is really nice, actually. We've got... Uh, well, that belt is getting a little sad, but not too bad. This one is okay. We've got two idler wheels for taking up the slack and forward and pulling the tape along in fast forward and rewind. There's a motor for that, and it looks like there will be a separate motor for everything else. There's a fuse, which is easily accessible, and the printed circuit board is underneath. So I'll have to take out these screws. Two more on that side. Maybe one more over there. And there, so six screws. There's a relay there, too, for some reason. Okay, cool. Wow. This is a very well-made machine. This is the main flywheel. This uh, belt is getting a little sad and should be replaced. Two printed circuit boards. One may be power supply or one may be for recording. I don't know yet. I'll have to trace things out. Here are two huge electrolytic capacitors. No doubt originals. I might replace them just because it's easy to. Looking underneath, you can't see very much. Germanium transistors, so that's 60s for sure. Electrolytic capacitors, I might measure a few just to see their condition. This small board appears to be a power supply and control board. These are funny shaped burly diodes. These are mylar capacitors. They are going to be just fine. This transistor may be for switching on and off this relay. I don't know. There might be some sort of regulator in there. or This could be a regulator. I don't know. I want to disturb this as little as possible, but I have no choice but to disconnect or cut some wires. And I think I can probably get away 
with just cutting these two and reconnecting them later. This is a red to the chassis, which suggests a positive ground, typical in 1960s equipment because they used PNP transistors. This orange is coming from the power supply. It might be power. Those are the output transistors. They obviously work. And way, way down there is a switch which determines the mode, whether it's playback or record. That coils for the bias oscillator. What I'm going to do is pull out one capacitor and see what it says, if it's looking good or not looking so good. I'm going to pick on that one microfarad 12 volt capacitor hiding between the transformers. I'm picking on that because if I unsolder one lead, I can get to both of them and I won't be measuring the other things in the circuit. I want to see what the capacitance and the effective series resistance are. So I'll get a sense of whether the capacitors are in good shape or not. The capacity has wandered up to almost two microfarads for a one microfarad capacitor. Its effective series resistance is 140 ohms, which is huge for a one microfarad capacitor. Wow. Here's another one. It's supposed to be 10 microfarads. It measures 30. I think it's fair to say that this unit needs new capacitors. I'm certain that they will fix the recording problem and probably help it sound better in playback. But another issue is the drive belts. I need to order some drive belts. Two of the four need to be ordered. I think I'm going to wind up part one of this video. I never intended it to be more than one part, but it's going to be more than one part. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please give me a thumbs up and consider subscribing to my channel. Stay tuned for the next part or the next video from Mr. Brown's Basement.